In this session, we're going to learn about trade area territory, and we're going to apply a very simple and straightforward gravitational model called Riley's Law to determine our, our regional trade territory. Out in rural Iowa, out in non-metropolitan areas, people are oftentimes preoccupied with the geography of their trade area. And it's a legitimate question, and it's not just the overall trade area for the community, but it's the trade area for a furniture store, a trade area for an automobile dealership. All of these are, are areas or geographies that merchants care about, and in part it's how are we doing, but it's also in part exactly what is the space within which I'm an effective enterprise. And so we, we have mechanisms for, for measuring that and it helps people understand basically the extent or the reach of their business. Now, we all know that with the internet and online shopping, a trade area can be virtual, it can be anywhere, but for the vast majority of what you and I buy on a daily basis, we tend to shop within our region. If we're buying a washing machine, if we're buying an automobile, if we're shopping for clothes, if we're trying to buy some kind of durable good or things to improve our house, we oftentimes, or more often than not, we're going to shop regionally. Now, the size of your trade area is always going to be a function of the degree of urbanization in an area. And the more urbanized an area is, the more specialized the businesses can become. And the reason they can become more specialized in highly urban areas is because the geography that they're able to serve grows larger. And they, they are, they're able to satisfy the needs of a population beyond just the urban population. Well, we can measure a trade area in a variety of ways. Some ways are pretty straightforward. We can just make one up, which is what a lot of people do. They just tell us what their trade area is. You can, you can use zip codes or telephone prefixes to pre-identify what you think your dominant trade area is. You could look at newspaper circulation areas, especially regional advertisers. They don't like to advertise if people aren't going to buy a product. And so your regional advertisers, their circulation areas, usually have a good sense of what the effective market area is for a community. You can conduct a survey, um, and you've probably come out of a store or out of a mall and, and been uh, met by, it's usually a young woman with a clipboard asking you if you're willing to answer a few questions about your shopping habits. And so those types of surveys give us a good sense of where shoppers come from. One easy way to figure out where shoppers are coming from, at least in Iowa, is to go out into the parking lot, let's say, of a, of a mall or, or a shopping center and look at the license plates. Um, businesses, of course, now can very easily look at check and credit card receipts and find out exactly where their shoppers are coming from. And then lastly, we can use what are called gravity models to estimate trade areas. A common method is to use what's called Gra uh, Riley's Law of Retail Gravitation. And it's a mathematical formula to help us identify market boundaries in geography, in space. And it measures your likelihood of shopping between two communities, assuming that we, if we live somewhere between two communities or in one community or in another community, what's the likelihood of us shopping in one or the other? And so it's a simple gravity model. It's very, very useful and it's something that can be applied very easily for different kinds of of, of products. It can be applied for furniture, it can be applied for automobiles, it can be applied using the admission uh, patterns for uh, a hospital to understand, for example, what is the hospital's primary trade area relative to all other competing hospitals in the region. And of course you can use it for lower level goods like gasoline and food it's not useful. You don't, you don't apply this type of model inside an urban area, densely uh, settled urban areas. This type of, of, of estimation isn't useful for that type of comparison. It's no good at all between comparing wealthy and poor communities. It wouldn't make sense 
uh, to compare Beverly Hills with a, with a much poorer um, suburb in LA using this type of model. It's certainly not good for different size community. A community of 25,000 wouldn't be compared with a community, let's say, of 500. That doesn't make sense at all. You would try to compare a community of 25,000 with some other urban economy that is reasonably diverse and well-developed. And one of the things that we, we, we need to remember is that it, it tends to overestimate the shopping population because it assumes that in general we're only making binary choices. I either shop here or there, my place or some other place. And it doesn't take into account all of the shopping opportunities that we actually have and the way in which we shop. As I said before, this is a gravitational model and it estimates what's called the breakpoint. And remember, this is just simply a demonstration of your territory. It is a simulation of, of what we think your trade area uh, is and, and it, it helps you just get a good sense of how well you're doing. And it is a function either of your population or your actual trade. So it's useful in delineating a, a trade area for a certain market on a map. Um, it has limitations, as I've already said, that people will only shop in the market with the greatest attraction. And again, that we don't cross market boundaries. Well, we know that's unrealistic. You and I go to all different types of places to buy things. But in this case, we're, we're treating this as if we have binary choices. The formula looks like this. And if it looks daunting, it really isn't. What we're trying to estimate down here is how far are will people willing to travel to shop at this place given the relationship between my community and some other community. And that is going to be the distance, the actual distance between my community adjusted by this term at the bottom. And what this term at the bottom is the, is the, the power or the gravity of market good, some good I in, the, in that other places and that other place relative to the power of that same market good or bundle of market goods where I am right here. So this P, this power, can be population, sales. We use population and sales um, to do these types of calculations, but you can also use employment levels, square feet of the store, the shopping space. There are other physical measures that you can use to substitute for P, but in the example that I'm going to show you, I'm just going to use population and sales. And finally, D. D is always going to be distance in miles or travel time via a road network. I'm going to treat it as distance in miles. What we want to do is to come up with a way to describe a, a region's, region A's trade area relative to some small neighbors, relative to some medium-sized neighbors, and then relative perhaps to a much larger economy. How far out does their trade area go? To do this analysis, you have to begin with sets of variables to plug into that equation. You have to have the distance in miles from your community. In my case, I'm going to study Storm Lake, Iowa, and I'm going to measure the distance to some regional trade areas that that, that it competes with. Cherokee, Spencer, Pocahontas, Sac City, Ida Grove. And I'm also going to extend this out to Sioux City. It's a metropolitan area to the west. Carroll, which is a relatively healthy, um, similarly sized trade area straight to its south. And Fort Dodge, which is a much larger uh, micropolitan trade area to its east. And Carroll is similarly sized to, let's say, Spencer up here, which is to the north. So I, I get medium, small, and a few larger trade areas that I'm going to compare my community to. Briefly, we're going to be applying this formula, and I'll show you how to do it in a spreadsheet. Here's the spreadsheet with the data that you just saw. It has the miles. You can just simply use Google and type 
Storm Lake, Iowa to Cherokee, Iowa, and Google will return the, the miles that it will that it is between those two places. So that's how we, we get the miles. Population, these come from the census. And then for us, I'm measuring all trade, or I'm using all trade to calculate my breakpoints. I'm using both population and trade. I'll do it both ways. And we get trade from our State Department of Revenue and Finance. It may be that your state doesn't have data like that. You can always get them every five years updated from the census of retail that comes from the Census Department of the U.S. Department of Commerce. So the first formula, what we're going to do is calculate the distance between Cherokee and Storm Lake that represents their breakpoint. So I'm going to start typing the formula. The actual numbers are down here, the way it would look in the formula, but I'm going to type the formula. This formula will help us calculate the distance or the breakpoint between Storm Lake and all of the other communities. So we're going to start with Cherokee. And that formula is going to be dollar sign B5, right there. That's the distance to Cherokee divided by the rest of the formula, 1 plus C5, which is the population of Cherokee, divided by dollar sign C, dollar sign 3, the population of Storm Lake. We're always going to be dividing by that. That's why I put those dollar signs in. Taken to the 1 half power, that's 1 half power, and then we're going to put two more parentheses to make sure we have a balanced number of parentheses. The one-half power is the same thing as the square root, and it'll give us our answer. So the breakpoint, given the distance between Cherokee and Storm Lake, is 12.5 miles, a little bit farther than halfway between the two communities. And that's using population as the foundation for the breakpoint. We can also calculate the breakpoint using trade as the basis. And now over here on trade, what we're doing is we're going to be, instead of dividing by population, we're going to be using trade as our, as our term. And so let's just copy this over, and then I'm going to correct the formula. What I need to do here is change this to a D, and then that corrects this calculation. Now I have the population-based breakpoint and the trade-based breakpoint, I can copy these formulas down, and it tells me my breakpoint to all of my other communities, and I can copy them to the outside communities as well, and it tells us the remainder of those breakpoints. Using population as the basis, the breakpoint is 12.5 miles away from Storm Lake going towards Cherokee, 18.5 miles towards Spencer, 24.4 miles towards Pocahontas, Sac City at 17.2 miles, and Ida Grove is 29.8 miles. I prefer to use trade as the basis for the breakpoint. And doing that, you can see that the numbers are a little bit different, um, perhaps meaningfully so here in the relationship of Pocahontas. Um, and you can see that they're also not that much different when you get a little bit farther away. So here I have a map. And uh, here is Storm Lake, Iowa right here. And then here are all of the communities. Here's Cherokee, and I've plotted the breakpoints. I've just guessed them for this exercise, but I plotted the breakpoints towards Cherokee or towards Spencer. Here's Spencer up here. Here's the breakpoint towards Spencer. Here's Pocahontas. I've, I've put the breakpoint right here. Here's the breakpoint going towards Fort Dodge. Here's the breakpoint going towards Carroll. That's one of the bottom communities. Here's the breakpoint going towards Sac City. I've broke, broken that right here. Here's the breakpoint going towards Ida Grove. And lastly, here's the breakpoint going towards Sioux City, Iowa. What is my trade territory here? And it would look something like this. And I would try to curve. I'm going to go a little bit below that breakpoint and then I would come up to here. And so for Storm Lake, I would designate this territory in the middle as being its primary trade area.